now what are the types of hyperglycemia what you get you have first what is known as a pre existing diabetes that is somebody who has a diabetes who develops covid diabetes can be either type 2 or type 1 and you need to understand that this gets aggravated because of covid the second type is what is known as a covid induced diabetes covid induced diabetes is what what we discussed partially till now that is because viral pathways which affect the beta cells or the drugs what you use in the covid they all can contribute we did release the management of uh, how to manage the steroid induced hyperglycemia position statement from endocrine society uh, this is online available free from indian journal of endocrinology some of you who are interested can look at it the third one is a stress hyperglycemia which is a transient state where they actually uh, can be identified only by looking at the beta cell uh, sorry the hba1c has to be below 6.5 which indicates that it's a transient state of hyperglycemia the diagnostic criteria remain the same the treatment options remain the same in this spectrum also when you look at a patient who is admitted in hospital how much to control what is the ideal range most of the targets given by the society is Uh, range the glucose value between 140 to 180 mg per deciliter the critically ill they may come down up to say 110 or so but you have uh, got a higher risk of hypoglycemia at that stage if you can manage at this level without a problem may be good but the best possible uh, inpatient target is say between 100 to 180 almost always that includes the fasting state as well as the post prandial state so you need to remember this whenever you are looking at how to manage the patient in a ward that most of the times it should be ranging below 200 and not below 100 when you look at covid also has a spectrum of illness that it ranges from asymptomatic to a very significant critically ill patients the mild ones and asymptomatic ones they don't come to the hospitals or they don't get admitted for treatment the moderate to severe ones are the ones which come where the oxygen saturation is dropped there is significant inflammatory parameters rise and critically ill obviously you require support of most of the major organs of the body and you have multiple drugs also in place at that point of time so that's important to know that it's a covid also is is uh, important to know when we have the uh, managing this patients where and how severe the illness what are the drugs the patient is using now hyperglycemia management is just not a one lecture it is like a i mean continue you require to know lot of factors before we actually start the actual management first is who is the patient is it type 1 is it type 2 is it stress hyperglycemia is it drug induced hyperglycemia because your uh, approach to drugs approach to the insulin all these things vary as per the situation as per the given patient and if he is a known patient of diabetes how well is it controlled earlier is it good control or a bad control somebody who started with a good control maybe a mild adjustments of the dose what he was using would be good enough but somebody who already had a bad control he requires further important uh, considerations and what was he using in the outpatient regime was it insulin was it only tablets what is the current glucose because if it's 100 you require to do something different if it is 500 you will do something different and what is the condition of the patient whether he is able to take orally not able to take is he on a continuous drip is not what is the setting where the monitoring facilities are available these are the things which are all these factors will determine what to choose when you are managing a patient in covid ward about glucose management 
when we look at the hyperglycemia this is a traditional pyramidal approach that is the diet exercise and oral monotherapy forms the baseline the foundation then you go on to oral combination then oral plus insulin and finally insulin multiple doses this is like a standard type 2 diabetes management of any hyperglycemia and unfortunately the options are increasing day by day year by year if you look say from 1923 when insulin was started and from here till about 1990 you had only insulin sulfonylurea and metformin to look at but in the last decade and two decades you have almost 20 new groups of drugs which are available for usage so that makes the options more but that increases the confusion also more and gives you all that perspective in a given patient what to use and what not to use these are the uh, different options which you look at as far as how to approach the hyperglycemia is concerned this is based on the pathophysiological octet and you have basically what is the reduced insulin secretion from the beta cell so you can use insulin or you can use the insulin releasing drugs that is sulfonylureas or glenides or the dpp4 inhibitors or glp1 receptor agonists they also some of them have a uh, property of increasing the glucagon and to reduce the glucose from the gut whatever you have consumed the alpha glucose days inhibitors are used the peripheral glucose uptake is increased by the metformin and the SGLT2 inhibitors are the ones which we use to prevent glucose reabsorption from the kidney and peripheral insulin sensitizers, the glitazone and some in the CNS, again the GLP ones have some effect. So these are the multiple options which are available in the management of hyperglycemia. We shall discuss some of them in relation to COVID. How do they fare in the management of COVID and diabetes? Metformin, the number one drug as far as the COVID and diabetes is concerned. It has multiple mechanisms of action. Its primary being the reduction in the insulin resistance and some of the benefits as a cellular AMPK activation, which actually senses the energy level in the cell some benefits as far as the antioxidant anti-inflammatory controls so being the commonest it had already got a meta-analysis which shows that this is the forest plot of it which shows the metformin users fared better than when compared with non-users as far as the covid related mortality is concerned so some of the data which says that metformin if it is otherwise indicated can be safely used in a given perspective about how much to use that we shall discuss later on coming to pioglitazone these are not very popular drugs in the management of type 2 diabetes some anti-inflammatory benefits are there especially in relation to covid and the negative benefit is negative effect is being they also upregulate the ace 2 they may which increases the portal of entry to the virus. So these are the two different, I mean, it's a double-edged sword. So some benefits and some drawbacks with the use of pioglitazone. The DPP-4 inhibitors, which had maximum noise when COVID came in, as far as the glycemic management is concerned, because of its high affinity between the receptor and the S receptor, but mouse models suggested that if you use DPP-4 inhibitors, you have reduced inflammation even in the lungs, which has not been translated into the human studies. Initially, when they came in, there was concern about increased susceptibility to infection because of DPP-4, but that did not happen in the clinical practice. And more or less, now some data to suggest that they reduce the severity of the COVID infection because of decreased virus cell entry and decreased viral load and some reduction in the pro-inflammatory cytokines and decrease in the cytokine storm. So all these will lead to a good glycemic control. In addition to it, some immunomodulatory activities which will help in achieving a good glycemic control. So by and large, DPP-4 inhibitors 
have a major role to play as far as oral drugs are concerned in a COVID patient. Sulfonyl ureas are potent anti-diabetic agents, but not a significant direct any role as far as links with the COVID infection. Uh, whatever studies showed which have used sulfonyl ureas have helped that there is no difference between users versus non-users. So you can use them safely if indicated in an appropriate dosage. The second major group which have said about uh, the benefits of uh, anti-diabetic agents are SGLT2 inhibitors. They also have reduced inflammation, they reduce the lactate and some macrophage activation is reduced. They, because of their propensity of reducing the uh, renal glucose reabsorption, some amount of water is also lost along with the glucose and there is a hematocrit is altered that is rise in hematocrit which will possibly improve the oxygen delivery to the tissues and will reduce the interstitial edema so these were the benefits which were described with the drugs and the dapagliflozin was the one which was studied as a in a randomized control trial in patients with covid but unfortunately the dare 19 was the name of the trial which was published a couple of weeks back this did not show any benefit with the usage of these drug than when compared without the usage of the drug but in a in the management of type 2 diabetes they have significant benefit and the concerns being because the glucose levels does not go up very much you may have what is known as a euglycemic ketoacidosis so you need to be careful about it and some dehydration concerns also exist with these drugs. HCQS was more in the newspapers and media rather than actual practice because uh, everybody wanted to use it. There were some governmental regulations, intergovernmental transfers of HCQS. Uh, not many countries have approved HCQS as an anti-diabetic agent, whereas India is one of the places where it is approved. There were some studies earlier where chloroquine has shown some benefit about in the against avian influenza, but not much. They basically prevent the replication of the virus and reduce the cytokine storm as well. But uh, not much of benefit, more of a hearsay anecdotal evidence rather than any significant uh, benefit. To put the matters in perspective, there was a review and meta-analysis which was published a few months back which said that this was the effect of HCQ on clinical deterioration and need for mechanical ventilation. Nothing was different, both sides, whether you use the drug or whether you use a control drug, it did not show much difference. So the speed with which the HCQ gained importance, it fell into disrepute thereafter and not many people use it. But if you have some other benefits, mild diabetes, maybe that is a place where you can use it. So to put all what I have discussed till now in a nutshell about anti-inflammatory properties, the common parameters when we manage the COVID are the CRP, IL-6 and ferritin. And each drug will have some of the studies which have showed these benefits that CRP level is reduced, IL-6 is reduced, ferritin is reduced with metformin. Most of the parameters, some of the gliptins have shown increase, but wherever the immunomodulatory properties did exist, they have shown maximum benefit as a standalone molecules in the management of COVID. So much so for the oral drugs, but in a COVID ward, by and large, the treatment is on the insulin. So we shall discuss about insulin for a few minutes before we actually look at how to manage. And when you look at the insulin, the something known as there is a basal insulin, something known as a bolus insulin. The basal is what? For the metabolic functions of the insulin, there is a constant release. Even if you are on a fasting state, your insulin production does not go to zero. There is a production of insulin, 
which needs to check lot of things functioning at the liver and muscle so you require what is known as a basal component of the insulin for it and bolus insulin is for the meal related rise of the glucose so whenever you consume a meal the glucose goes up so to cover up that rise in the glucose you require a prandial component so you require a basal and bolus insulin by and large and the components are about 50% of the total requirement is basal and 50% is the bolus so in a that bolus is subdivided between three meals depending on the ratio what the patient is taking either a major meal in the morning or in the afternoon accordingly so this is the basic things about uh, insulin how much or what to use 